My name is Estela Sanchez. I'm 39 years old, and today is September 28, 2015. I'm in Sacramento, California with my mentor, Eric Vega. My name is Eric Vega. I'm 63 years old. Today's date is September the 28th, 2015. Uh, we're here in Sacramento, California, and I'm with Estela Sanchez, my friend, uh, uh, civil rights activist and uh, uh, the leader of our organization. So, Eric, I always wondered what what makes somebody grow up to be an activist and to get involved, and I always wondered what you wanted to be as a kid. <laughs> oh, well, it's so good to talk with you. Um, <laughs> when I was a little kid, I was a part of a big Mexican family, and so we did things together. We had great laughs and music and good food, but my mother said, you got to go to the fields. You and your cousins have to go to the fields, and so there I saw poor people, really poor people, and I was part of a poor people's community that was working in the fields. And 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 I brought away from that for years after that just this image of a mayordomo as a, mm. a, this guy with a whip that actually was like walking down the lanes, and it really impressed me. Like I wanted to do something to mm. stop people who had whips in their hands. It was just a kind of crazy image, but it prompted me it just kind of sparked me that I wanted to somehow go in the direction of being an activist of some sort, and I didn't know what it was. When I was in high school, there was a young man, I think today he would be called transgender, and all the young boys would look at him and make fun of him, and all the young girls would look at him and make fun of him. And that image also really stuck stuck inside of me, and I didn't know what to do about it, but I knew I wanted to do something. So all of that is to say that it prompted me in the direction of wanting to make trouble around <laughs> class issues, gender issues, uh, race issues, and uh, it stuck with me. Oh, wow. Tell me about some of your mentors, people who have influenced you, you know, from being a young person and seeing those type of images. Um, you know, were there any people who were mentors that you looked up to that were doing the things that you wanted to do? You know, I, I was involved in anti-war protests here in Sacramento, like around 1968, 69, something like that. But I felt like I didn't understand what I was really protesting. I just wanted to be a part of a group protesting. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't have any mentors. And then I spent four years in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And... I knew that I did not want to be about being in the Air Force. I just realized that was the most horrible mistake I'd ever made. But when I got out, there, at the very beginning of the 70s, there were lots of young adults that were exploring the Chicano movement, that were exploring Marxism, Leninism, that were exploring unionism, and teaching young people about those kind of currents. So I had, really fortunately, like three or four different people that just um, kind of took me under their wing and told me a little bit about, well, this is how this works. Are you going to show up for this thing? Have you read this? And, uh, and it was enlightening. It was mm -hmm. wonderful. It was a, a, a very uplifting uh, part of my life. You've been a part of so many different movements, you know, and I've known you now for maybe 20 years almost, and I always see you running from one meeting to the next. And I think even though I've known you for so long, I don't know if I know all of the different movements that you're a part of. So I'm just wondering if you can tell me a little bit about um, the different movements and groups that you've participate in, participated in and the work that you've been doing in the community. Well, I helped run uh, this communist bookstore here in Sacramento for a while and got to know lots of different people and it was very invigorating and so I guess um, I got exposed to kind of abstract political theory but my involvement in the Chicano movement meant that I was going to do union support work as an example so I you know I did some stuff around supporting the United Farm Workers and then from there I continued to say well you know unions are essentially the the organized expression of working people it's like the democratic expression of what working people want. You know, and you go back to the 30s and you find out unions were really great because they gave you the eight-hour workday. They took kids out of the factories. You know, they provided gloves. They raised the wages. They gave you weekends off. And so the more I learned, the more I wanted to be in strikes and do things, you know. And, and so that was very, very fun. Uh, having said that, 
you know, a lot of times uh, organized labor loses because mm. the forces in this country are stronger than organized labor right now. But that'll change. The next thing, and, and I think uh, w when I started knowing you, Estella, was around the period of time of Proposition 187. Mm -hmm. And for many Latinos, Chicanos specifically, uh, that was a real eye-opener because there you had a movement in the state of California that was openly attacking our families, mm -hmm. that was openly like becoming hostile to a people. That's right. And we knew, no, you don't know my tia. You don't know uh, any of my, they're really hardworking people. And so we got involved and, and we did things politically. Now we lost, <laughs> but I think it was, um, it was um, kind of enlightening for people to see how power works in California and how it impacts certain people. So um, those were some of the, you know, immigration has been an ongoing thing. Um, I, I used to go over to Sacramento City College, and I think that's where I, I met you. Um, right. I was doing a lecture on immigration. So what you and I are doing today is what we were doing, like, <laughs> many years ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the issues are still out there. That's right. I think I was part of a student group organizing a Marxist conference. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I knew anything, you know, about it as tip of the iceberg learning. Um, and you were a professor at Sac State and you came up to us and you gave us your card. And I remember the group of us afterwards were like, we felt like we won the lottery. We're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> it's a professor from Sac State, you know? And I think for, for the three of us who organized, we were young people who didn't have parents or older siblings that went to college so it was a really big deal to see somebody who was older than us say good job mm -hmm. you know I'm at Sac State I'd like to see you guys up there so we were really excited it was mm -hmm. a really exciting thing and I think that after that you invited us to be part of the activist school mm -hmm. which is now part of our organization it's, so it's just this full 360 um, it's so one it was of really our exciting. programs yeah. yeah yeah it was really exciting now I'm wondering um what does the equal and just community look like to you? Because I know that justice, social justice, has been such a big part of your your work and your life's purpose. But what does that look like to you? What does it look like to have a, a equal and just community? Um, so there's a lot of different um, aspects of that. So, so uh, in our country today, we still have this big immigration question. I think it's divided up over a long period of time between those people that believe in a kind of a law enforcement approach to the question of immigration. And then there's an emerging other movement, and it's developing all around the world. And it flows from that idea that there's no human being that is illegal. That's mm -hmm. actually one of the slogans mm -hmm. that we have over at the mm -hmm. Soul Collective. And, and it says people are displaced economically all around the world, and we need to treat people decently and open our hearts. It's, you know, it's the Pope. <laughs> writ, writ large when you think about it. Well, that, so that's an ongoing big political challenge for us to convince people that other human beings are exactly that, human beings, and we need to open our hearts and, and our doors uh, to them. But there's, another, you know, there's other things. There's class inequality. So in this country, CEOs are getting hundreds of times more than the, working, the, the people that work for them on the ground floor. It doesn't have to be that way. And so we need to try to figure out how do we... Uh, create movements of people that demand class equality in this country and and make sure that the elites don't distort both our minds and the economy for bad ends. And that leads over to environmental issues. Mm -hmm. What we've had uh, all around the world, but particularly in the West, is the kind of glorification of greed in a lot of ways. And and what's that, that, what that has led to was ecological disaster. So a productionist, consumption-oriented society is going to overuse the natural resources. And that's where we're at right now in terms of water, in terms of the land, in terms of the air. And all of us know, ultimately, that when we cough from asthma, then when our eyes are hurting, when the water tastes bad, when the climate begins to change and it impacts our bodies, we know that things are out of joint and that things are truly connected, as 
many Native American activists would say, all things are connected. Absolutely. And we need to try to figure out ways of joining those different movements and those different perspectives to make sure that we change things for, for the better. Absolutely. I feel like a few years ago, we were at a table and it was we were we were just having a conversation like we are today and it just became really clear you know i remember telling you like eric the the next struggle isn't going to be about wages it's not going to be about these things we're going to be fighting for really basic things like water and food and our air yep. you know and here we are you know years later and it's really you know the direction that we're going in a lot of the struggles that we saw and you know what we would call quote unquote third world countries you know, not having access to these basic things, um, you know, are coming home into our own communities now with, um, you know, struggling for, for water locally. Um, you know, one of the big issues is how do you talk to people? How do you get into the minds? How do you get into the hearts and minds of people? And one of the things that I've learned from you and that I think is a great quality that you have is to incorporate culture and music and the voice into political messaging. It's like today in the environmental movement, there's more and more Christians that are coming over, but you, you, don't, you don't talk to them and say, you know, stop being stupid about the environment. You say, Jesus would want you mm -hmm. to take care of the land and to see it in harmony. And I think, um, I think you bring that same sensibility that you have to use uh, good, healthy language and imagery to help people move in a certain direction. So I definitely, yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like it's not a fight and it's not a, sh it shouldn't be a struggle, but it's more of a, a balance, a rebalancing, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. rather than winning a battle, we're trying to bring balance to the, you know, to the field and, um, I've always found art and culture as a powerful tool. And I remember even during those early days when we were organizing, and I remember the um, local Zapatistas Coalition mm -hmm. was organizing, they would bring great bands. Mm -hmm. And as a young person, it was really exciting to mm -hmm. come to these mm -hmm. rallies because you knew you were going to hear some amazing bands. Mm -hmm. So I think throughout that process, I learned what a strong tool um, the arts were and um, bringing across a message and bringing people to a place where they were open to hear a message. Um, and I think with our work at Soul Collective, the Arts and Cultural Center that we've both uh, helped bring into existence, you know, in the city, I think that's been central, you know, that that art culture activism um, has really worked in blending those different things together. Um, and it's still evolving. It is. You know, it's still evolving, especially when we move into media, and the use of media now, um, I'm really interested to see how this next generation picks that up because that's a whole nother tool, mm -hmm. um, you know, in using social media to bring across information and the access to things like online radio and to um, video and being able to spread that out. So I'm really excited about the next generation that we're yeah. mentoring and where they're going to take things. Which brings me to another question I had for you. Um, you have mentored so many students throughout the time that I've known you. You know, when I met you, I think there was a group of maybe five of us that you had kind of taken under your wing um, as a college professor and had, you know, taken us on, um, I think the first... Um, event that you that you had us be a part of was a Sacramento activist school and then soon after that you took us to the maquiladoras in um, Tijuana that's right where we had a chance to go and visit the factories there and learn mm -hmm. about the um, labor issues mm -hmm. there and since then I mean you've just I've seen you mentor so many students year after year in these last 20 years and I've always just wondered um, why has that been so important to you and um, and where did you learn that? You know, where did where did that come from? Yeah, in in different revolutionary struggles around the world, uh, where the revolutions were successful for national liberation or for trying to develop socialism, uh, the revolutionaries got old, mm -hmm. and their ideas became old. And you know, like many people, you 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 start repeating things over and over again. And you, you lose some of the imaginativeness and vitality that is so important for continuing to, to get people engaged. And so 
in my mind, uh, going back to many years now, um, it was important to try to not just stay with ideology, in other words, ideas, but to work with people and do things. And in the process of working on campaigns, on working on issues, develop new leadership. So you are the very best. You are a leader. And uh, you've done that because you're not just a book person. You're a you're doer. You know, you get into meetings. You lead discussions. You point the direction. You're ambitious. You're smart. And you drive our organization forward. And so um, uh, I, I continue to work with young people because of you, because you are an emergent leader. And we need more leaders. We need lots of leaders. Well, I appreciate the kind words, and I also just appreciate, um, you know, that commitment that you made because it's it has been 20 years, and you're definitely a person that I've been able to count on for the last 20 years to be there. Um, I think the first project I brought to you was starting a library at a local community center, and you were the first person that you didn't even ask the second question. You wrote me a hundred dollar check to go buy the books. And um, I can't tell you how much that means, you know, to a young person starting out and having ideas, um, you know, it was so encouraging. And I think every idea I've ever had, whether it failed or it was successful, you were there to back me up um, with it. And so that's definitely something that I learned from you. And we have a lot of young people right now at Seoul that we mentor and mm -hmm. that it's something that's very important, I think, for the organization and that I've learned from you and that I've picked up um, from you and try to follow in that footstep of really helping develop the next generation of leaders in our community and really supporting the work that they're doing um, and being there and providing whatever resources we have at hand. So that's definitely something that I appreciate from you and that I've learned um, throughout the years. Well, and I really appreciate when you make presentations that you show yourself to be a critical thinker. I'm thinking back, we, we did something over at uh, one of the community centers, and it was a panel on Cuba. And um, Estella got up there, and she presented both sides of an argument regarding the revolution. In other words, she just was not, I'm sorry, you were not just a knee-jerk supporter <laughs> of the revolution. But you thought critically because you wanted people to think about it. And, you know, I think that informs your activism. You, you have an open mind and you're a critical thinker. And that's, that, that serves young people well. Because you don't just want robots, you know. You want people to think for themselves and, and make things better. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I remember the first time that we went to, um, you know, we went out to uh, Tijuana and I remember we presented then, and I didn't agree because I think what was being said was, well, you know, it's a really a harsh situation here for the people working, and we really need to support and help them get organized. And I thought, well, you know, my parents came over, and they had to cross over because there weren't any opportunities in Mexico. And I remember I had a chance to talk to the people who worked in the maquiladoras. And yeah. I asked them. I, th I think I was one of the few Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we're really happy. You know, a lot of them were like, we're really happy that we don't have to cross over and risk our lives. You know, and we're making so much, which at the time seemed like very little money in the U.S., but in Mexico it was great money. So I remember asking some critical questions mm -hmm. there and bringing some critical questions. And instead of you getting upset or saying, no, that's not, you know, what we're what we're here for, what we're looking at, you were like, that's a great question. Let's look at that. And that was very encouraging because I don't think um, you were trying to convince us of anything. You were showing us what was happening, and then you were really um, open to hearing what we have to say, even if it was it was not exactly what you were saying or even if it was an opposition of what mm -hmm, you were saying. Mm -hmm. And I remember from that time on, I felt very comfortable because I felt that I could ask critical questions and that I could look at different sides um, and that's something I carried on even as a teacher mm -hmm. because I felt it wasn't my place to try to brainwash anyone to the beliefs that, you know, I had, but rather that, you know, there was this belief that in presenting the truth, you know, trusting that people would look and that there were some things that just as a human being you just knew 
were wrong. Mm -hmm. And if you presented the truth that, you know, people would make the right decision. And so, um, you know, it, it's interesting because I still remember that. And I've always felt comfortable, you know, <laughs> even when, you know, when we don't agree, we agree to disagree. Um, and I think there's a couple of, you know, points that, you know, we, we see things in a in a different light or in a different perspective, but that we respect it. And, um, and that's something I've always appreciated about you, that you've never said, hey, you have to, you know, I believe in this or I support in this and you guys have to as well. It's always been really open, I think, for everyone in the organization. Um you know, and I appreciate that. <laughs> well, absolutely. You know, but the, the truth is that you've led our Soul Collective to real success. I mean, we're a credible organization mm -hmm. in Sacramento, and it's, I know we're a collective, <laughs> but it's your leadership, and that's, the, people have to talk about that, so. Yeah, and I think when we look at collectives, and even with what we were talking about, of like looking at, um, you know, new ways of being and new paradigms, I often feel like the collective is an experiment mm -hmm. in that and looking at how to collaborate with people and work together with people with different ideas. Um, in a society like ours, it's very individualistic. So the collective mind isn't one that's natural. So I think even in the collective over the, the last 10 years, mm -hmm. we run into a lot of um, obstacles and, blow, and, and roadblocks because it's a different way of thinking. It's a completely different paradigm to think about a collective mm -hmm. when you're moving forward mm -hmm. rather than think about the I and what I want to do. So... Um, you know, I often I feel like, you know, being um, the director in a collective is a weird thing because I feel like I have to hear what everyone had to say and figure out a way to mesh what everybody's vision is. And there's a lot of just amazing groups that mm -hmm. are part of our mm -hmm. collective. So I think for me, the challenge is always just figuring out how to make sure that we um, honor what all of the different individuals are bringing to the table and figure out a way to move forward with everyone's vision and finding common ground, you mm -hmm. know, within that mission, which I think we're, you know, continuing to do. And like, It's not easy because we want to do so much, you know. It's like, <laughs> And ah. everyone has all these different areas of interest yeah. and different ways of doing things. But I think we are finding, you know, a way. And I think, like you said, a lot of the different struggles that we're looking at, labor, um, immigration, um, environment, all of these things, they do um, have places where they overlap and mm -hmm. they intersect. And mm -hmm. I think as an organization, those are the things that we're starting to figure out as a group that um, all of the different leaders in our collective, our work does intersect in many ways. And I think now, you know, hitting the 10 year mark of um, running a collective, we're starting to figure out how to really use that to its um, best potential, mm -hmm. you know, and to really how to harness um, that collective power. So I'm really excited about what the next 10 years looks like for the organization. And I, I really feel that we are, we are um, pioneers in the arts and cultural programming, especially when it comes to collectives. Um, you see a lot of them starting to spring up all around the country, and it's really exciting. So I think we do have a lot to share and, you know, maybe some of the mishaps and some of the struggles getting to this point. Um, well, we've survived, and I think we're successful. And when we're asked to tell stories again in tell, 10 years, it's a lot, <laughs> hopefully it'll be like, oh, yeah, that was the first place, and now we have five of them, and one of them is in Havana. <laughs> yeah, that, that <laughs> might be that might be what <laughs> happens, you know. There's definitely people looking um, at the model and trying to open up um, spaces like ours. So I'm really excited, you know, that people are getting more collective-minded. Um, well, well, what were the things that, that uh, prompted you to get involved in around this, the whole Soul Collective, but just generally around art, music, and activism? I think like you, when I was a kid, um, you know, I was exposed to a lot of injustices. Seeing, you know, my parents worked in the fields mm -hmm. and the tomato fields here surrounding the city. Um, my extended family did as well and so I think as a kid I always felt like man this isn't right there has to be a better way like for us to live mm -hmm. um my mom had the foresight to put me into a, a private school um for first through eighth grade and my mom had a third grade education and my dad's illiterate mm -hmm. and so for them to you know have kind of that you know foresight to say we want our kids to get the best education possible really made me feel like I needed to do something with it and um you know I ended up going through private school until eighth grade and then in high school I dropped out you know I went from a really 
wonderful school where I knew all my teachers to a huge public school where I didn't know anybody in those thousands of students. Um, and I think when I got back into community college after dropping out of high school, I ended up taking a proficiency exam and I started uh, City College at 17. And I was just kind of wandering there, mm -hmm. just basically taking classes that I liked and really not, you know, didn't have any plans. But I got into activism and that conference was one of my first conferences that I organized. I think after that, after I met you, I started working on the um, tribal gaming okay. campaign, which you connected me with um, one of the organizers. And I think it opened up a lot of doors for um, a way to really address some of the injustices that I have seen as a kid and, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with discrimination and immigration issues that I saw my parents having to deal with growing up. So I think activism opened that up. And then when we added the other layer of I was organizing these events, but it was really hard to get students to come mm -hmm. in. And when we started adding music or a mm -hmm. DJ, the things we were already interested in, then it really... You know, I really saw there was a difference there than we had students actually showing up. So I think, um, you know, right off the bat there, I noticed that those things went hand in hand, that um, there was a way to use art and music as a tool for educating the general public about social justice issues. And, um, and it was a funner way to learn. It wasn't mm -hmm. that you were getting, you know, somebody was preaching to you. And, you know, especially as a 19, 20-year-old, that's the last thing you want to hear is someone telling you what you should or shouldn't be doing. Um, and so it was definitely a different way to intake information. And, um, you know, I realized that that was going to be a really great tool um, to use. And how many people do you think we've, like in the last year, how many people do you think we've reached out to and had over at Soul Collective? It's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, I think I've done some gen general number crunching just for, you know, things that we needed. And um, it's been between twelve and 15,000. Um, That's incredible. At least, yeah. you know, because we had one event where it was 5,000, mm -hmm. another one where there's 2,000. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say fifteen to 20,000 you know, people, and that's not including, you know, any of our online reach. You know, our Facebook numbers are at 12,000. Our social media is pretty big. Um, you know, I often go to other cities and people know who we are, and I'm always so surprised, and I'm just like, what in the world? And Because um, you went to the Southwest. Um, we've been to Texas, um, yep, to South by Southwest, um, in Austin, on the East Coast, it's always just really interesting that, you know, the reach that mm -hmm. social media has mm -hmm. and to, that people get encouraged. You know, they see things like Curanderismo, you know, that it's a program that's, you know, happening at Seoul. And they're so encouraged by what we're doing or the way that we're blending art and culture and activism. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we definitely have had a, you know, an, an impact locally. Um but also on a national level. We, um, we were talking about curanderas and brujas in my class the other day. <laughs> and I said, okay, so how many of you in this class of 40 uh, have ever been to a curandera? And people are looking at each other, and then, then they, and the hands start <laughs> going up, and it's like about 15, 20 people in wow. the class. You know, and they'll just say, you know, yeah, I had the the fear in me, and so I went over to a curandera, or I had this big old bump on my elbow, and it went away because I went to Stockton and saw a curandera. And I said, well, you need to go to Salt Collective because <laughs> we have a whole program on this stuff. You know, and it just goes back to that idea of culture and thinking back, you know, when we were kids, and our culture was always um, diminished and stepped on and looked at as something that was backwards, you know. Even the, the idea now of a curandera, like people get embarrassed or shy to say that, you know, they've been to one or they know what they are, yet we'll see that to go to a holistic practitioner in the city, you're paying $100 to go get knowledge that your grandmother had. Mm. And I think for me, that was what I realized when I went to the first curanderismo conference was that, you know what, our our culture has always been undervalued, mm -hmm. yet the, it'll be taken, it'll get remarketed, and get sold back to us in many ways. And, um, you know, I think that's part of what, we've been trying to fight at Soul Collective to just, you know, really keep 
our culture intact. And I think that's something I, you know, it was a class I took somewhere, sociology class, I want to say, at community college. And it was something that just stuck out to me that by the third generation, our culture would be lost. You know, after the third generation of being in the U.S., we have, we would be assimilated and we wouldn't have any of our cultural heritage intact. So for some reason that stuck out and I think that's actually why I really wanted to keep that cultural component in the work that we did because I didn't want what my parents brought Mm -hmm. to someday not be remembered, you know, by my children. And, um, and I realized as, you know, as a young person as well, that, um, you know, a lot of us, we would become the interpreters um, for our parents, you know, going places, and there was this embarrassment about speaking Spanish, and you know, um, you know, or looking too ethnic. You know, everyone would try to acculturate and assimilate right away. Um, and I've always hoped that Soul Collective has has or con- or does um, fight and combat that in our community. That that isn't the case for the next generation. That it becomes something that they're proud of. That we have traditions. Um, that we have knowledge, like curanderismo and holistic health, that it's always been part of our, um, you know, our story. Um, things like, you know, we live in, in what's now being called a farm to fork mm-hmm. capital. Um, you know, a lot of us, you know, like the two of us have parents and family members who were part of, you know, the people who built the agricultural base in the region. And, you know, when you hear about farm to fork in the city, you don't even ever hear those stories of the people who immigrated to this area to work in those fields to build it into an agricultural state. Yep. Um, you know, and so f- for me, it's been really important to make sure that that cultural component is um, honored and that it's um, that it's placed, um, you know, in the community so that it's seen and not hidden. Well, I think we've actually done a great job of that, of making credible uh, folk healing and different traditions that could easily be lost. But I think we've also tried to promote new culture and kind of hybridization, Absolutely. you know, by bringing in different voices and different styles and fusing. I mean, it, it, it's us, but it's also the different groups that we bring in all kinds of stuff there that goes on our walls it goes in the music it goes in to the dialogue that we have just lots of different voices it's so healthy Estella yeah it definitely has been surprising what it's created I mean the one good example is with the Sikh community and um, you know having a space for the arts for the Sikh community I never would have thought that would have been something that would have grown out of our organization and um and it's been amazing. I mean, the events that we, we've had and the fact that people from the UK will come to our center mm. all the way from the UK mm-hmm. because it's become known as a place that's open for Sikh artists mm-hmm. and that um, promotes, you know, their their artistry. And that's just amazing to me that that has come about. And it makes me think about the lack of spaces for culture and for developing this community and for hybrids because like you said there there is some high hybrid to that of where it's the next generation of Sikh artists who are Sikh and holding on to their cultural traditions and elements Mm -hmm. yet there are a lot of young people who've grown up as children of immigrants in other countries whether it's the UK or the US and so then there's this mix and I think it's, you know, the same um, with our music label mm-hmm. that we've created out of the center. It's become a hybrid of sounds, of music, of of children of immigrants. Mm-hmm. So I think you're right. I think it's definitely, you know, it's growing in its own direction and it's um, pulling from, you know, our traditional roots, but also growing because mm-hmm. we are here in the U.S. and we are influenced by a variety of things growing up here. So what do you think have been some pitfalls or problems that you've seen over the years in the work that you do? You know, I think a lot of times we're a little bit ahead. You know, we're, we're, we're visionaries, you know, we're artists, so we we will see things sometimes five years ahead mm-hmm. and we'll get so excited and try to do it. And we'll run with it, and it'll be very frustrating, you know, maybe for the first five years. Even the idea of a collective starting that 10 years ago, people didn't understand Mm -hmm. what it was. 
um, or why we were trying to blend art, culture, and activism. Um, so I think that has been one of the, the frustrating parts or one of the, the pitfalls is kind of jumping in ahead of things before they become popular or before they hit the general public, specifically here in our city, right? Because a lot of these things are happening in different parts of the world or there are things that we've been influenced by seeing maybe in larger cities. But bringing it to, uh, you know, a somewhat smaller community like Sacramento, it's sometimes an uphill battle to try to start something that's innovative um, when people really, you know, aren't ready for it. So I think for our organization, that has been it. But I think 10 years in, I think now we have enough of a track record to show that some of the things that we started early on ended up becoming trends down the line. So um, I think it's been helpful, you know, that we have been around for 10 years. Well, I agree with you. I mean, um, our eyes have been big, you know, and we've tried to do a lot of different stuff. And I think we're right now at the 10-year 10, 10 mark where we're thinking – we need to f try to focus a little bit more carefully with our resources and and make sure we do a really good job on the things that we do do. So, yeah. Absolutely. I have one last question for you. What is What do you think that every citizen can do that would create change? Just one or two things that just the average person could do to create change. Um, I think that people have been taught in this conservative culture uh, to think of themselves first rather than thinking in terms of a community. Mm. And so uh, one of the ways that historically people overcome that tendency of being kind of narcissistic is to join an organization mm. and be one voice part of a collective voice mm. and, and understand uh, uh, the commonality in a viewpoint. So, you know, Margaret Thatcher, I think, famously said, there is no such thing as society. There's just individuals. Mm. And we, and what the work that we do is about trying to encourage individuals to become a part of a collective and be a part of a community and to work w with what a community wants to do, which is to stay healthy and promote and, and thrive and do good things in the world. So. Well, I want to thank you, Eric, for having that type of mentality and for thinking of us as a collective and as a community and for mentoring myself and others in the community. So I just want to thank you for having that, you know, state of mind that, um, you know, we're all in this together. So thank you so much. For I want to thank you, mentorship. Estella, for, for being the next uh, generation of leadership and uh, hands-on, can-do, forward-thinking, eyes-bright, moving forward. Yeah, that's what you represent to me. So Appreciate that. <laughs>